Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. To proceed. Moving on with our classes, our lessons in the Sunan of Abi Dawood, another great Imam of Hadith, Sulaiman ibn al Ash'at al Sijistani, who died in the year 275. Uh, as, as opposed to what some people have said that he died in the year what is it that some people said can I see the uh, results for the fifth so we can uh, mention some of the most commonly missed questions before we start the lesson we've discussed previously actions done during fasting that was all of last week's classes basically actions that come and they may or may not be halal. What's the ruling on these things that happen during the day for a fasting person? Now we're going to discuss in the next series of lectures the things, the, the people who are excused from fasting. What are their situations and what is the ruling on, on them? When they miss a day, do they have to make it up? Do they feed a poor person? Uh, and so on. The people excused from fasting, what, is their, what are the different cases they have? Uh, and uh, the evidence is related to all of that. This is the fifth. Okay. The issue of uh, Shafi'i and Malik, the two great Imams, and their position on food that's left in someone's teeth after Suhoor and after the Adhan has come in. You've eaten Suhoor, the Adhan is in, now you have your intention, you're fasting, but you notice you have some food in your teeth. You haven't used your miswak yet, and you have like a piece of meat in your teeth or something else. As Shafi'i and Malik, what's their position on this? You can eat that. Yeah? Granted. That would be a nice support for that. Excellent. A brother mentioned here locally. Uh, could that position be supported by the idea of you having something in your hand? The vessel is still in your hand when you hear the adhan, and you can finish what's in that vessel even while you hear the adhan. And that would be a nice support for that. So long as you restrict it to, the f as soon as the adhan is called, and in the first few minutes, or the first minute or so, of the uh, entrance of the time of Fajr. But if you would uh, go you know, a little beyond that, uh, without limit, and say at 10.30 in the morning, that's when you notice you have the food in your teeth, you can swallow that, and that would be going you know, beyond the, the text or beyond the way that you could support it with that text. But good, that's a good uh, way of looking at it. Jazakallah khayran. Uh, so now, so that's the position of two great imams, that you can actually eat that food that's in your teeth. Swallow the little piece of food that's in the teeth. And the rest of the scholars and the majority viewed what seems to be correct, that that's considered eating. And that nullifies the very idea of fasting. That you can eat things, uh, whether it's small amounts or large amounts, we can't intentionally eat during the day in Ramadan. And there's ijma of the, on this, with the exception of that position. As we mentioned, there's ijma that there's no eating to be done during the day in Ramadan, the whole ummah, except for this very issue. That's all. That Malik and the Shafi'i opposed the rest of the scholars and said that they, you can swallow the food that is remaining in your teeth after the time of Fajr has come in. Uh, and of course, I hope no one picked that uh, spinach in the teeth is a sign of inner beauty. <laughs> That's the joke answer. But sometimes people are picking the, the, the joke answers, which is surprising. Uh, what's the next one? Number two, the majority of the scholars hold cupping to be something that breaks the fast. Yeah, That wasn't clear apparently because 18 people missed that. The majority's position on cupping, bloodletting, during fasting is that it breaks the fast. Aftar al-hajim wal mahjum That the fasting person, or the, the, uh, the one who is cupped, had blood let out of his system, uh, and the one who did it have both broken their fast. That's what the majority understood, that 16 of the Sahaba narrated this, which shows that it was something so plentiful, nar plentifully narrated that, even, that a Suyuti uh, mentioned it in his book that it's mutawatir. It's one of the hadith which have reached the level of being mutawatir. And the other hadith, I believe, is Shaddad ibn Aus, where the Prophet وسلم, had cupped, had had himself cupped while he was fasting. It comes from one Sahabi. And it seems to be the case that it, it's clearly done. It was clearly done earlier than the speech of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Allah knows best. That's what we discussed in our class. The third one there. Um, so beginning today, chapter number two. 
if you notice the order of our uh, the order we take from this uh, chapter, this book of fasting is somewhat interrupted here by our returning back to the second bab. And we're going to see why, because we've made the, the subjects sort of coincide with each other. Now we're going to discuss the people who are exempted from fasting and what is the ruling on such people and what are their categories. So now this has to do with this series of lectures, so we put it off until we, to this time. باب نسخ قوله تعالى وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية and the, the chapter of the abrogation of the statement of Allah وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية and upon those who are able to fast is a فدية the whole ayat فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونه فدية uh, coming with, after the verse the first verse oblig, or, or legislating the fasting of Ramadan يا أيها الذين آمنوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ أَيَامًا مَعْدُودَاتٍ فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ عَيَامٍ أُخَرْ وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ Ayats number 183 and 184 of Surah Al-Baqarah O you who believe fasting is legislated for you as it was legislated for those before you so that you might have taqwa days that have been legislated and counted out for you so whoever is sick or on a journey then he should make the days up he can make the days up from other days and for those who can those who are able to fast and this verse was specifically revealed regarding older people in the beginning of the legislation when older people were, were requested to fast it was ala khiyar they could fast if they wanted to and if they didn't want to they could feed a poor person in place of every day of fasting it was up to them meaning an older person who's able to fast if he was able to fast he would be given the option that was in the beginning then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the next verse number 184 فَمَنْ شَاهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْهُ And whoever has seen the, the moon, or had in, in the ruling of the one who's seen the moon, he's been told that the moon has been sighted, then let him fast with the order from Allah Azza wa He must fast. And then Allah exempted the traveler from that, or the, and the sick person. From the introduction that we have had now, we see that there are th- some basic groups of people who are exempted from fasting. How many have been mentioned so far? Two. Okay, who are they? Travelers. Sick. Okay, right in the ayat, travelers and sick. And the understanding of the ayat without being mentioned in the ayat, old people in the beginning of Islam. Let's add to the list women who are menstruating. Women who are in postnatal bleeding. Pregnant women. Breastfeeding women. And a reminder that, do you have all of those? Sick, traveler, the sick one, patient, uh, traveler, uh, the old person. Pregnant woman, breastfeeding woman, menstruating woman, postnatal woman, and postnatal bleeding. Anyone else missing here from people who are exempted from traveling? Yeah? You want me to identify the types of women again? (laughs) Um, Menstruating women, first one. Second one, women who are in the same kind of idea, postnatal bleeding. After having a baby. Third category, pregnant women. Fourth category, breastfeeding women. <coughs> and then other excused people, maybe women as well, travelers or sick people. Travelers, sick people, and old people. And old people. Those are the basic. Ex- people exempted from fasting that we're going to talk about. And we're not going to talk about all of those categories today. Today we're talking about pregnant women and breastfeeding women. And we're also talking about 
that's all. That's all we're going to talk about today. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the traveler, and uh, we may talk about along with that the sick person, or or shortly after tomorrow maybe. So today let's talk about this verse first before we get into the pregnant and breastfeeding woman, pregnant women and breastfeeding women. The first hadith is from the two Sahihs of Bukhari and Muslim, number 2315. It comes as the first hadith in the second chapter of Kitab al-Siyam from Qutayb ibn Sa'id, who narrates from Bakr ibn Mudar, the authority of Amr ibn al-Harith, who narrates from Bukair, who narrates from Yazid, the freed slave of Salama, who narrates from Salama ibn Akwa, the Sahabi, who narrates from the prof, or who, who talks about the revelation of this verse. Lemma Nazarat Hadihil Aya Wa'ala Ladina Yutikun Hufidya Ta'amu Miskin. When this verse came down, and upon those who are able, meaning old people who are able to fast, Fidya Ta'amu Miskin, they have the option to pay a fidya, to pay a ransom that they can not fast and feed a poor person for every day they don't fast. He says, كان من أراد منا أن يفتر ويفتدي فاعل حتى نزلت هذه الآية And he mentioned the one after it. فمن شاهد منكم الشهر فليصمه فنسختها He said it was the case in the beginning of Islam that whoever wanted to break fast could break fast and make a fidya. Feed a poor person. Or feed a person in place of that day of fasting. Until this ayat came down, number two hundred, number number one hundred and eighty-five. I'm sorry, number one hundred eighty-four, or number one hundred eighty-five. Sorry, one eighty-five. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ أَشْهَرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ. Then whoever has witnessed the entrance of the month, then let him fast it. This ayat came down and abrogated the earlier ayat. That's the statement of Salama ibn Akwa. Before we talk about the fiqh of that, let's read the second hadith which is a Hassan hadith coming from Ibn Abbas. And notice that the first hadith is a statement of Salama ibn Akwa. Now, this was the understanding of the majority of the Sahaba and the majority of the scholars. The majority, what Salama mentioned here. Look at what Ibn Abbas says. Ibn Abbas says that, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ فَكَانَ مَنْ شَاءَ مِنْهُمْ أَنْ يَفْتَدِيَ بِطَعَامِ مِسْكِينٍ إِفْتَدَى وَتَمَّ لَهُ سَوْمُهُ It was the case that whoever wanted to break his fast, from those able to fast, would do so, and feed him a poor person in the place of that day. And then Allah said, فَمَنْ تَطَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَهُ وَأَنْ تَسُومُ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ And then another stage of revelation came, and whoever uh, wants to... Whoever wants to give sadaqah or do extra, then that's good for him. But for you to fast is better. Now fasting is better for you. Out of the two options, fasting became the better one. Then Allah sent down, فَمَنْ شَاهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ And whoever has seen the moon, whoever has known that the entrance of the month has occurred, then let him fast. All of those being there in the ayats 183 to 185 from Surah Al-Baqarah. So here, Ibn Abbas doesn't mention abrogation. He says this was revealed, and then this was revealed, and then this was revealed. The idea supports what Salama said though, without using the word abrogation. That this was the case, and then Allah revealed this, and then this was the case. It seems to be what is understood as abrogation. An important term here to understand abrogation. What is it? Abrogation is the lifting or the negation of a previous established ruling with a later established ruling. And the meaning of established ruling is a ruling that has a basis in the Quran or the Sunnah. So an order that was early for the people to do something or a legislation that's established by a text is cancelled by a text that came later to nullify the meaning or nullify the ruling in that text. So for abrogation, you see, there are parts that must be there. What must there be? 
there must be two texts. An earlier one and a later one. Two texts that establish opposing rulings for there to be abrogation. There can't be two texts establishing the same ruling. Rather, there has to be a contradiction between the two verses. And so the later verse is the abrogator, is the nasikh in Arabic, and the earlier verse is the mansukh. That's the idea of abrogation. Some of our salaf, some of the earlier scholars, like the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, they used to use the word nasikh, abrogation, to refer to tahsis as well, as we're going to see exemplified in this issue. That not always did they consider abrogation to be the entire nullification of the ayah. But they would allow that nullification to be a partial nullification. So if you wish, a uh, nesh juz'i, a partial nesh abrogation. Meaning that the entire ayat has not been negated, or the, 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 the rulings found in the ayat, all of them haven't been negated, rather some of them have. And that is also known as abrogation. And this is one of those cases that Ibn Abbas will clarify for us, Tarjuman al-Qur'an, the great scholar and explainer of the Qur'an. Ibn Abbas said this ayat is not mansukh. Ibn Abbas said decisively, this ayat is not mansukh. It is not abrogated, the first ayat mentioned. Rather, the ruling remains for the al-hubla wal murdi for the pregnant woman and the breastfeeding woman. This ayat remains for the pregnant woman and the breastfeeding woman. And some of the scholars have understood that to mean that she must make qada, she must make the day up, she is excused from fasting, but she has to make the day up after the pregnancy is over or after the breastfeeding is over, and at the same time she still must feed a poor person for every day. So she's got two obligations. Double the obligation. You might say, right now, that seems a rough, that seems like a rough thing, since the traveler doesn't have as much difficulty as a pregnant woman or a breastfeeding woman. And a traveler is excused from fasting, and he just makes the day up, and he doesn't have to pay any fidya. He doesn't have to feed a, pa- a poor person or anything. A sick person as well, who's sick, he just makes the day up later without feeding anyone as an obligation. So this pregnant woman, how is it that, and the breastfeeding woman, why are we putting a double uh, penalty on her? That when she breaks her fast, she has to make the day up and she has to pay a fidya. A number of scholars have said that, and they thought that's what Ibn Abbas meant when he said the ayat is not abrogated. However, we're going to see, insha'Allah ta'ala, the correct position of Ibn Abbas. Uh, and that is, after we read the first hadith in the next chapter, chapter 3, بَابُ مِنْ قَالَ هِيَ مُثْبَتَ لِلشَّيْخِ وَالْحُبْلَى The chapter of the people who have said that this ayat is مُثْبَتَ. مُثْبَتَ, here is the opposite of mansukha. It means here muhkama as well. Uh, verse, the verse is, it remains, and it's not abrogated. So the first chapter, or chapter number two in the Kitab al-Siyam was those who said it's abrogated. And really, if you notice, there's a statement of Ibn Abbas, but no mention of abrogation. And Salam ibn al aqwa said it's mansukha, it's abrogated. Now we find Ibn Abbas, and he says quite clearly, Uthbitat al-hubla wal This ayat remains effective, legally effective, for the breastfeeding woman and the pregnant woman. And he believed that it was abrogated for the older people and for the general people that they could fast if they were able to fast or not. They could fast or not, take the choice. And if they chose not to fast, they, they could feed a poor person for that day. So he viewed this part was abrogated. So here we have partial abrogation. This was understood by many to be taqsis, to specify a general meaning and not abrogation. Either way, you call it partial abrogation or specification, nesh juz'i or taqsis, it all has the same meaning in the end. 
that part of the meaning and part of the rulings that are established in this ayat are abrogated and some of them remain effective. That's the idea. Whether you want to use the technical word that it's mensukh, neschen, juz'iyan, or it's muhassas, it's specified, or it's partially abrogated, the bottom line is the, they agreed that the understanding here is that this ayat is no longer supporting the idea that you have a choice to fast or not, if you're able. However, the pregnant woman and the breastfeeding woman have a choice. If they fear that they may break, if they fear that they may harm the child, they're not getting enough nutrition for the breast milk, or that they're not getting en- enough a- nutrition for the baby in the womb, they may break their fast. And the scholars differed over how they make that day up, or what they do in place of that day. And I'll give you the three basic positions. The first one is, as mentioned, they do both. They make the day up later, and they feed a poor person for every day they missed, which is heavy and difficult. And this is the position, actually, of a shafi and Ahmed, and as well Mujahid, the student of Ibn Abbas. And they said along with that, Mujahid, they said along with that, the old man who is unable to fast, the old, you know, old, old people who just can't fast, it's not possible, that they are exempted from fasting and they just feed a person, a poor person, for every day they miss and they don't have to make the day up. And this was the action of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu who became old and gray and unable to fast and this is what he did in his old age. He fed people for every day that he had to fast and he did not attempt to make the day up. And that specifically was stated by Shafi'i and the Hanafi scholars and Al Uzai. It's part of the first position though. Hmm? The Hanafi scholars, yeah. That's part of the first position though. We're talking about the pregnant woman and the breastfeeding woman. The first position is that she has to do both make the day up and feed a poor person for every day. The second position is the madhab of Sufyan al Thawri and the Hanafi scholars, Al Hassan al Basri, Al Ta al Makki, Ibrahim al Nakha'i, Ibn Shihab al Zuhri, and others, that she just has to make the day up. A list of scholars, I won't ask you about that. If you wanted to mention a couple of them, Sufyan al Thawri and the Hanafi scholars. The most uh, outstanding. Ibrahim al Nakha'i, you can add him too. Ibrahim al Nakha'i, Sufyan al Thawri, and the Hanafi scholars. They said that she has to make the day up. The pregnant woman, breastfeeding woman, has to make the day up. A special position held here. Who's the other Imam that we haven't talked about from the four well known Imams? Malik. Malik. Malik's position was that the pregnant woman should be treated as a sick woman, she should take the ruling as a sick person. So the sick person makes a day up later with no penalty. This is Malik's position, the third position, yeah. As Malik says, there's a difference between the two kinds of women here. There's no one ruling for both. The pregnant woman should be considered like a sick woman. And the breastfeeding woman, she should be uh, made to make the day up and also feed a poor person for every day she missed. She's considered as a pregnant woman to be like a sick woman, a sick person. So she makes a day up only. But the breastfeeding woman, the murdi, the breastfeeding woman has to pay a fidya. Has to pay a fidya. Perhaps because the pregnancy entails signs that are like sickness. You know, the woman who's pregnant, in many times and cases, she'll be as a sick person. She'll seem like a sick person. She'll have the signs of being sick. No, this is... A, a minority position held by Imam Malik. Yes. No. And the tahqiq for the issue, what seems to be correct for this issue, is if we rely on Ibn Abbas here, the Turjaman al-Qur'an, 
we find that he said explicitly, إِذَا خَافَتِ الْحَامِلْ عَلَى نَفْسِهَا وَالْمُرْدِعْ عَلَى وَرَدِهَا فِي رمضان, If a woman is afraid for her child, breastfeeding or pregnant, afraid for the child, fearing for the child not getting proper nutrition, then she can break her fast and pay the fidya explicitly, he said, without making the day up. She does not have to make the day up. Allah. And a number of explicit statements have come from him affirming this. Ibn Abbas. To finish this issue up briefly before we uh, establish Maghrib, statements from Ibn Abbas have come with authentic chains negating the misunderstanding of some of the scholars that Ibn Abbas obliged the woman to pregnant woman and breastfeeding woman to make the day up and to pay a fidya to feed a poor person for every day that she's fasted. This is an error in understanding the words of Ibn Abbas as it has come in explicit narrations from him narrated by Imam al-Tabari in his tafsir uh, with sound chains by al Qutni in his sunan with chains that he has called as an imam in, in, in the defects of hadith he has called Isnad and Sahih to Ibn Abbas that he was asked about a woman who was pregnant or breastfeeding and he said you are similar to uh, you are like the one who is not able to fast you are in a situation of one who is not able to fast so the generality is along with the, the anyone who is like a pregnant woman breastfeeding woman or has a sickness that is called muzman a sickness that is like uh, leads to death or a sickness that la yurja baruhu it's not possible it's not likely that you would recover from this illness right illnesses that are terminal or that progress and become worse we cannot tell such a person you have to make the day up logically when is he going to make the day up he's going downhill his sickness is taking over and his condition worsens by day when will he make the days up doesn't make any sense. So the way out for that person is that while he's alive and the fasting is obligatory on him for every day of Ramadan that he has to fast, he has to feed a poor person. And a number of ulama have given the fatwa that if perchance he becomes healthy after that, then he does not have to make those days up. And it happens sometimes. He or she. When a person is terminally ill or with a sickness that is, he or she is not expected to recover from, and they begin paying for poor people to eat for every day they have to fast, and then Allah blesses them with good health again, after not expecting that. Then such a person does not have to fast the days that have been made, that have been, uh, fidya has been paid for. Uh, and the one who has to make the days up is the normal sick person, who you have the flu, you have a cold, you have something which puts you in the category of a sick person. You have to make this day up, as you would expect that inshallah in a week or so you'll be fine and you'll be able to, to fast without any problems. So similar is the case of the breastfeeding and pregnant woman. It's a situation that goes on and on. Some women, they're either pregnant or breastfeeding every Ramadan. If she's not pregnant, she's breastfeeding. And it might go on 10, 12, 15 years like this. Either pregnant or breastfeeding. Maybe both. <laughs> it's possible. Um... And there's no, there's no problem with that. And what do you want to tell a woman like that? If she goes on for 12 years, every Ramadan, pregnant or breastfeeding, will you tell her now? Which fatwa will you, will you give her? Huh? 12 years of fasting now. 12 times 30. What is that? 360 days of fasting. Not only you have to feed 360 poor people, but on top of that you have to fast 360 days. What's the crime that she's committed to deserve such a punishment? <laughs> She has been pregnant or breastfeeding. It seems to be the case that this is you know, a little harsh. And what is more appropriate is the concession that was the, the confirmed and resolute decision uh, you know, offered explicitly by Ibn Abbas. Surah Jaman al Quran talking about when the ayat was revealed and who it was revealed about, having great insight and knowledge of the Quran. And with it, uh, a number of the scholars held that position as well. Uh, now, that seems to be what is correct for the woman who is uh, pregnant or breastfeeding. She pays a fidya. 
not pays a fidya, she feeds it'am, she feeds a poor person. When we say pay a fidya, if that means she uh, takes money from what she has or food from her house and gives it to her husband or her brother or someone to go give it to a poor person, then we can say paying a fidya. That's what's meant by that. But uh, not to give the money to poor people as cash, but rather it's it'am. It's a fidya, feeding a poor person. And the ibadat and their expiations, all of those are legislated and it's not subject for you to say what's the value of the meal and I'll give the value in money and all of that. Rather, it's to be it'am. Feeding is supposed to be done. Whether she feeds the person directly, like she invites some poor sisters over to her house and she feeds six people in one night, six ladies in one night at her house, uh, and that counts for six days, or whether she feeds one poor person six times, uh, that would count as well. The idea is a meal for a poor person uh, with what is considered by the custom of the people as a meal, something that would feed a person until they are satisfied. And she does that for every day that she is, uh, that she breaks her fast because of fear for the child, uh, for the, bre the breastfed child or the baby in her womb. Supporting this is a hadith that comes from the Messenger وسلم, found in the Sunan of a Tirmidhi or the Jami' of a Tirmidhi. And uh, number 715, it's actually coming up in our Sunan Abi Dawood as well, next class, tomorrow, inshallah, because it's related more directly to the traveler. The statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَبَارَكُ وَتَعَالَى وَضَعَ عَنِ الْمُسَافِرِ شَطْرَ الصَّلَاةِ وَعَنِ الْحَامِلِ وَالْمُرْضِعِ الصَّوْمِ Allah has lifted the burden of half of the salat for the traveler. And he has lifted, lifted the obligation of fasting for pregnant and breastfeeding women. The hadith which is Hassan and it's found in the Jami of At-Tirmidhi. And I mentioned uh, number 715 and it's coming up in tomorrow's lesson. We'll get some more uh, details on the meaning of that hadith in our lesson tomorrow from Sunan Abi Dawood, insha'Allah ta'ala. There are some more points to this lecture which we'll have to finish after the salat before we begin our lesson in tafsir, insha'Allah ta'ala. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, was salatu was salamu ala rasulillahi wa ba'd. Can anyone summarize the three positions of the ulama on that issue of the uh, pregnant and breastfeeding woman? Now, uh, Okay. Feed a person, for a poor person, and make the day up. Okay. That's one position. Uh huh. He's separated between the two of them, right? Yeah, he's separated. Are you sure about that second position? The position of, who was it? A Thawri yeah. and Ahl al-Ra'i, the Hanafis. That's correct? No, it's not. Ah, that's a, that's a, there's a mistake there. Only make up the day. Oh, just make up the day, okay. Don't, pay the f don't uh, feed uh, people uh, for every day missed, but rather just make the day up when she's not pregnant or breastfeeding. Okay, the third position, Malik, he distinguished made a distinction between uh, pregnant and breastfeeding. Said the pregnant woman makes the day up and the, pregnant, the, the breastfeeding woman, she makes the day up and feeds a poor person. Alright, then I, uh, we mentioned the uh, position of Ibn Abbas, the true position. Which one of those three was it? No. Wasn't any of those three. Alright, which shows you there's a fourth position. Al-Khatabi mentions the first three positions only. And many of the ulama don't even discuss this last position. That it is actually the position of Ibn Abbas, in truth. It's something that has it's escaped a lot of them. I believe Sa'id ibn Musayyib had this position. It's a very minority position. And you find some of the ulama being very harsh on the people who hold this position. You'll find some of the ulama being extremely harsh against people who hold this position. But the, the, the case that this is established from Ibn Abbas 
talking about the ayats and the order they were revealed and their meanings. Ibn Abbas, his position is not to be considered a weak position, even if you say it's not the correct position here. You cannot consider it like this is a position of desires and following your desires. Anybody who has this position has to repent to Allah. It's an issue where you have a very solid base to say this is the position of Ibn Abbas explicitly. This is also the position of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. Add that to the equation. Ibn Umar gave a fatwa exactly like the verdict of Ibn Abbas. But this, as the question is, how could this escape the majority of the scholars? This, these things happen. Our ummah and the majority of the ulama or the consensus of the ulama is protected from error. The majority of the ulama is not protected from error. That's a big important uh, point here. When we talk about ijma, consensus, the consensus of the ummah is always protected from error. The ummah will never unite upon falsehood. But it's very possible that in some issues here and there, the majority don't have the correct position. That may be the case. The majority is usually a strong position, but not in each and every case. Sometimes you can find that the majority seem to have missed a hadith, or the majority maybe they've missed a statement of Ibn Abbas and Ibn Omar in this case. These statements are collected by Imam al-Tabari in his tafsir. Yeah, Ibn Omar giving the same verdict as Ibn Abbas, that you should make a fidya, feed a poor person, and you should not make the day up, specifically saying you should not make the day up. It's in a Tirmidhi, did I say 7.15? Yeah. And it's also coming up. It's from a hadith, verily Allah, wada'a an al-musafir shatra salat You might say, wow. The, uh, the Prophet wasallam said Allah has taken the obligation off of the traveler for half of his salat. And the fasting of a pregnant woman and a breastfeeding woman. There's a hadith here. Uh, first case, first thing is the hadith is not uh, agreed upon its authenticity. They differ over the authenticity of the hadith in the first place. Second problem with the hadith is that it comes in one narration and the, Allah has uh, relieved the traveler and the pregnant and breastfeeding woman from fasting. Now it's a proof against us. Because why? If Allah has, has relieved the traveling person of fasting, the ummah has ijma' that فَإِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامٍ أُخَرْ He has to make those days up. So then, likewise, mentioned right along with the traveler is the pregnant and breastfeeding woman. So then, yeah, so then the other narration of the hadith is against us. There's a, like I said, the hadith, that's why I mentioned the hadith last. Why would I mention a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ after the statement of Ibn Abbas and Ibn Omar? Because the hadith has a number of different ways of looking at it. First of all, it's not hands down authentic. It's considered a hasan by Shaykh al-Bani and by a number of scholars as well. Um, but other scholars have criticized the authenticity of the hadith and said it's not acceptable as a proof. And some of them said it's acceptable. But however, wajhul dilala, wajhul istidlal is that Allah has relieved the woman of uh, the pregnant and breastfeeding woman of her fast, but she has to make it up another day when she's not, she's no longer breastfe breastfeeding or pregnant. She has to make it up, and that's a concession from Allah that she can do that. So the way to understand the hadith, it's not one way only. And it has to be that this is a proof that she um, makes a fidya and doesn't have to make the day up. So the hadith is not entirely clear in the angle of its proof, if it's authentic. But what comes from Abdullah ibn Abbas, the verdict of Abdullah ibn Abbas is clear, authentic, with authentic chains, leaving no place for anyone to say that Abdullah ibn Abbas, which many scholars have said, and that's what a lot of the scholars base their position on, a misunderstanding of the position of Ibn Abbas. So the same scholars who held the position against this position should actually hold this position because the true position of Ibn Abbas was that the pregnant and breastfeeding woman uh, may be excused from fasting and she makes a fidya, she, makes, uh, she feeds a poor person and she does not make the day up. That's the position of Ibn Abbas. So those scholars who relied on what they thought was the position of Ibn Abbas should lighten up and be easy on the people who hold that position because it is the true position of Ibn Abbas in, in after checking and after verification. Similarly, Abdullah ibn Omar held the same position. There it gets strength upon strength to be the fatwa of Ibn Abbas and Ibn Omar. 
You cannot say to people, Taqillah, and stop following your desires. We're talking about people who are following Abdullah ibn Abbas, Turjaman al-Qur'an, about an issue directly related to the verses of the Qur'an, and following Ibn Umar, known for his vigilance, and following the Prophet wasallam. two of the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba, specifically Ibn Abbas, talking about the abrogation of one ayat and what it means. Very important uh, evidences in the case and uh, deserving to be followed more than anything else that the other positions have. And Allah wa ta'ala a'lam, that seems to be the correct position, even though it's minority, a minority position. No. Chapter number 40, we'll take it very quickly because it's a very small chapter, one hadith. Uh, inshallah, very easy issue. The hadith is also found in Bukhari and Muslim, so we can skip the chain. It comes from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha that she said إِنْ كَانَ لَيَكُونُ عَلَيَّ السَّوْمُ مِنْ رَمَضَانِ فَمَا أَسْتَطِيعُ أَنْ أَقْضِيَهُ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ شَعْبَانُ It was the case that I would have to make up days from missing fasting in Ramadan. And I would not be able to make them up until Sha'ban came. When is Sha'ban? It's the month before Ramadan. So that means... 11 months have gone, or 10 months have gone by, and she's in Sha'ban trying to make up the days of fasting. Many scholars have explained that is due to her service to the Prophet wasallam and being available to the Prophet wasallam um, and her dedication to him, that she would not fast except with his permission, uh, and she would generally not fast when he was around. Um, it shows the permissibility of delaying the qada. For a person who is excused, a person may delay making that fast up in the within the year. Where there's a the mention of I wouldn't be able to make it up until Sha'ban means that she understood that it could not be delayed further than that. So a person who has to make a day up, it is not obligatory on him to make it up right there in the beginning of Shawwal, the tenth month, right after Ramadan. He may delay it until another time. However, it becomes obligatory on him to make it up. If Sha'ban comes around and he has not made those days up. Ibn al-Qayyim mentions different positions of the scholars related to the one who actually the year went by and he did not make up the day. What is due to him? Entire year went by, he was excused from fasting and he did not make up the day. So what has happened? Is there a sin involved? Is there an expiation? Uh, the first position of some of the scholars, this was the position of the majority, the position of uh, Ahmed, Shafi'i, and Malik, that they have to feed a poor person as a penalty, along with making the day up, once it is delayed beyond a year, as a penalty. The second one, second position, is held by Abu Hanifa, that the only thing required is to make up the day, and no additional penalty. And Qatada, and some of the other scholars, a handful of them, said, rather a person should pay a fidya, feed poor people in place of the days that he should have fasted, and that's it, and don't even make, not make the days up now. And not make the days up. It's possible to understand that last position in light of what we just mentioned. If we say that a person, a year has gone by, a person who is excused from fasting, and a year has gone by and they didn't make the fast up, they can be two types. One type is a person who was able to make the day up. The sickness or the reason for them breaking their fast was gone and they could have made the day up. And there's another type of people that the reason they broke their fast never left them. So they never had the chance to make the day up. That's possible, right? That an entire year went by and a person was still sick the whole year. Or traveling all over the earth and they never stopped traveling for the whole year. That's possible. So in that case, we can possibly apply the statement of Qatada to that, especially the sick person. Because when a sick person now is sick for a year, it begins to look like this is a sickness that will prevent any type of future fasting. When someone is sick for a year, you sort of understand this is some kind of sickness that is serious, and it's probably not going to get better. If someone was excused from fasting because of a sickness that lasted an entire year. So then it sort of puts that person in the category of the sick person who is continually sick who will pay a fidya 
And that's possible to understand Qatada's position in light of that, if that's the second category of the, sick, of the person who is excused. And a year went by, as if to say, since a year has gone by, then he must be excused with an excuse that is continuing. So then when will he make it up? If a year goes by and he couldn't make it up, how can he make it up along with the missing fast from the next year? It would be an extreme hardship for such a person. And so it seems to be the case is a person who is excused, according to the majority's opinion, uh, the majority of the scholar's position, that a person who is excused from fasting and then he did not make the day up and a year went by, he has to make the day up whenever he can. And there doesn't seem to be any evidence to oblige him to make a fidya or to put a penalty on him. We need evidence. It's an ibadah, an act of worship. And it seems to be correct, the position of the majority, having no evidence to oblige someone to <coughs> fast as a penalty or to give uh, food to a poor person as a penalty. مسألة أخرى. فإذا ذهبت السنة. Yeah. أن مر السنة والحامل عليه القضاء والفدية في السنة الأولى. فأتى رمضان وهو. Let's excuse the hamil. He's asking. Okay, so the pregnant woman and the breastfeeding woman, the entire year went by, and now another Ramadan has come and they haven't made the days up. We're exempting that issue because we've discussed the issue of the fasting of the pregnant and breastfeeding woman now. As we concluded. Or I have concluded, I don't demand that you conclude with me, that the, uh, the pregnant and breastfeeding woman uh, pays a fidya or she feeds a poor person. That means that she's not waiting to make the day up. So she doesn't actually enter into this issue if you have this position, the position of Ibn Abbas and Ibn Umar. So we're talking about other people who are sick or traveling or another excuse other than pregnancy or breastfeeding. Wadah and karam, wala bil arabi labud. Okay. So we're exempting those two cases from this issue. Aki. Um, did you say that the majority's position was that uh, to feed a poor person and make the day up? No. The majority's was just to make the day up. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, the, I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken. Exactly. Jazakallah khairan. What I said exactly the first time was correct. The majority's position is that they do make a, a fidya. They do... Uh, offer a penalty or an, an expiation for a negligence that's the majority Shafi'i, Malik and Abu Han, uh, and uh, Ahmed their position was that they have to make a penalty and they base that actually as I remember now they base it on a number of the fatawa from the Sahaba so it does have strength so that's the yeah. that seems to be the strongest position Allah. as Abu Hanif is saying there is no fidya it seems to be and that the majority's position is correct no. Jazakallah khairan for helping me with that no. And the last chapter, which we can take uh, insha'Allah with some time, chapter number 41, the person who dies and he has to fast. And he had fasting that was due upon him. Building on what we have established already, that some people are sick continuously, some people are breastfeeding, and some people are uh, pregnant. Those people who do the fidya, according to the uh, understanding we've reached uh, they if they die without making the fidya then the fidya is to be made on their behalf if they die without actually feeding the poor people that they were supposed to feed then the way you make up their fast for them is to feed those poor people if the person was obliged to fast to make the day up to make a qada and they didn't make the qada then according to some of the scholars you can make the day up on behalf of them the wali of the person the male heir, brother, uh, son, or the likes, can fast on the person's behalf. And that comes from the hadith, which is the first hadith in the chapter. Uh, it's in Sahih Muslim. It's on the authority of Aisha radiallahu anha, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ مَاتَ وَعَلَيْهِ صِيَامٌ صَامَ عَنْهُ وَلِيُّهُ Anyone who died and they had a fasting, that, a, a day of fasting or some time of fasting that was obligatory on them to do, then the wali of that person, the male heir or the male guardian of that person will fast on behalf of that person. It's in Sahih Muslim. Some of the ulama said, the cases that the Prophet wasallam dealt with amongst the Sahaba and he ordered them to make the fast up, they were all regarding fasting which was obligatory by way of another, by way of a, an oath that a person took to fast. 
I make an oath to fast for three days. Now it becomes an obligation on you. As we mentioned in the beginning of our lessons on fasting, the ways that fasting becomes obligatory, one of them is a personally made oath. So now when someone makes this oath, it is a debt that they have now put themselves into. They have to pay this debt. It is a debt that a person has voluntarily gone into. And the Prophet ﷺ likened this kind of fasting to a debt when he said to a woman who asked, my mother has made a vow to fast and she has died. Should I fast on her? He said to her, Should, if, you, if she had a debt and you paid it on her behalf, wouldn't that be considered taking care of your mother's rights? She said, yes. So likewise, fast on her behalf to take care of the deen of Allah, which has more right, the debt that, uh, that is due to Allah, which has more right to be fulfilled or paid back. So he likened the debt, the, the, the fast of a person who made a fast by an oath, he likened that fast to a debt. So a number of the scholars said specifically then, this order, من مات وعليه صيام صام عنه وليه That's specifically for the one who has a fast that is obligatory on him because of an oath taken, or a vow, if you want to say a vow instead, a vow. That's the position of uh, Imam Ahmad, it's rooted in the position of Ibn Abbas, Abu Abayd, Al Qasim, Ibn Salam, Al Layth ibn Sa'ad, and a number of uh, Imams of the Tabi'een. That it is the oath or the vow taken and the fast that is made obligatory based on that, that's what the person can make up on behalf of a deceased relative. Other than that, no. The fast due in Ramadan, then that is not to be made up. They've taken a general phrase from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Men Mata Wa Alayhi Siyam Sama Anhu Waliyuhu, a very a general meaning, whoever has died and he had an, a fast that was obligatory on him, then his wali, his male guardian, heir, representative, can fast on behalf of him, or should fast on behalf of him. Now that hadith which is in Sahih Muslim is general. And based on face value of the phrase, it includes anyone who had an obligatory fast to fulfill, whether it was from a vow or not. So now, other scholars responded to this position and said, you have no right to specify this text without evidence. Just because a number of ahadith have come with a case where the Sahaba had parents or deceased relatives that had obligations to fast because of vows taken, does not mean that it's restricted to that case only because of the generality of the phrase, of the hadith. It does not become a mukhassis just because the cases that were known in the time of the Prophet ﷺ were all related to vows. It does not become something that specifies a general text. Rather, a, a text which is established from the Messenger ﷺ may only be specified by a clear text just like it. Not just the idea that the only cases that came up were cases of vows. To summarize the positions of the ulama on this issue, it's the position of a Shafi'i, Malik, and Abu Hanifa, three of the four Imams, that there is no making up of a fast for a dead person, whether it be from a vow or from any other type of obligation. Do you see any problem with this position? It seems to go against this hadith. And right now I'm, I apologize, but I don't know what it is that led them to go against this hadith. It may be that they viewed it to be abrogated. I'm not sure right now. Uh, first of all, before I say a Shafi's position was that, let me weaken that a little bit. This is the position of Malik and Abu Hanifa, and it seems to be the position of a Shafi'i. As they say, ظاهر قول الشافعي seems to be the apparent what can be deduced from a Shafi'i's words. But it's not explicit from a Shafi'i like this as it is from Malik and Abu Hanifa. As another narration has come from a Shafi'i and it's another position, it's a position held explicitly by Abu Thawr, one of the Shafi'i scholars, that the exact opposite is the case. 
that all obligations, all fasts from obligations can be made up by the male heirs or the male representatives from male relatives. Or actually not male, I'm adding the word male there without intention. Inheritors, heirs, relatives, male or female. And I did not mean to specify male, that was a mistake. As many a hadith, there are women asking the Prophet them to fast on behalf of a dead mother and he tells her to fast on behalf of her, on her behalf. Uh, so I did not mean to specify male, that was a mistake. So the relative fasts on behalf of the deceased or uh, the, on behalf of the deceased. So that's the position of a Shafi'i in one narration and Abu Thawr, a Shafi'i scholar, explicitly that any obligation can be made up. Any obligatory fast can be made up by a relative. The third position is the position of Imam Ahmad Ibn Abbas. Yeah, I already mentioned this. Yeah, that's the case where you make up the the fast from another only. Okay, so we have the three positions then. Now, the three positions are are clear. Now, again, the first position was the position of Ahmed, Abu Ubaid, and Qasim ibn Salam. It comes from the position of the Sahabi ibn Abbas and others that it's for the fasting that was made obligatory by an oath made, a vow. That that's the one that can be made up by a relative, by the relative of a deceased person who had an obligatory fast on them from a vow. But the fasting from Ramadan or Qadha or Ramadan or making up a day from Ramadan or anything else, then those are not to be made up. That's from the generality of the cases that were that were dealt with in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, that they were cases of vows, all of them. However, the second position and the others didn't have didn't view that to be enough to specify the hadith. The position of a Shafi'i and Abu Thawr uh, position of a Shafi'i in one narration from a Shafi'i and Abu Thawr uh, as well was that what you can not you can make up the fast for a deceased relative no matter what kind of obligation it was and the position of Malik and Abu Hanifa and in one narration from a Shafi'i or in uh, apparent understanding of some of his words can be that uh, there is no making up there is no niyaba fil ibadat there is no making up an act of worship for another person. Acts of worship are offered from a person to benefit his own self, uh, and there is no making up of an act of worship for another person, or no offering worship on behalf of another person. Granted. Uh, is, is there like a The, the question is, when it's known that a position was a position of a Sahabi, can you, is it like issues of Aqidah that you cannot go against the position of the Sahaba and you must stay within the positions of the Sahaba? And the answer is yes. You must stay within the positions of the Sahaba. And the meaning of uh, the, the, lack or the lack of permissibility of going outside of the statements of the Sahaba is not specific to Aqidah. On top of that, do not think that the list of scholars I give you is comprehensive. When I mention to you this is the position of so and so and so and so, I'm bringing to you the most famous people who held that position uh, or attempting to do that. And I'm not attempting to be comprehensive. So because in this, this, ca this issue that I've mentioned, I've only mentioned actually one Sahabi, and that's Ibn Abbas. And I mentioned to you that his position was that what you can make up the fast... Uh, for the nether, for the oath, and nothing else, right? That doesn't mean that's the only Sahaba who had a position in this issue. Uh, rather, it's the only one I've mentioned here, the only one I've been able to gather. Okay, so uh, don't uh, jump to the conclusion that that's the only position allowed because Ibn Abbas, his position is the only one that we have there from the Sahaba. Therefore, it must be the correct one. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that the other positions have some Sahaba. And in general, each position that we come to that is an issue of differing, you're going to find uh, the differing goes back to the Sahaba, usually in most cases.
usually. And uh, I, I may or may not be able to quote to you the names of all the Sahaba in each position. No. So with that, we'll close. And specifically, what are we going to say about this issue? Yeah, what's the stronger position? Let's say, let's go to Sheikh bin Baz. Some of you are saying, Hanbali. He's a Hanbali, so we already know what he's going to say. All right, so let's go to Sheikh bin Baz, the great uh, Hanbali scholar, and see what he has to say. Whoever dies, the question, uh, whoever dies about the hadith in Sahih Muslim, whoever dies and has an obligation of fasting, uh, and there's, there's a reason why I'm saying Ibn Baz is a Hanbali here. Just hold, bear with me for a second. Uh, no. Then uh, we heard that this is about a person who has a fast that is due because of an oath that he has made. However, some of the ulama mentioned on a radio program, or a program, doesn't mention radio, uh, that this is also for Ramadan as well. All right? And you know the differing already amongst the ulama. Is this correct, or is it correct what we already know uh, from the, uh, the books that we have? Uh, please uh, give us an answer, and may Allah reward you well. As-Sawab, the answer. As-Sawab, from Sheikh bin Baz. Annahu amun wa laysa khasan bin nadar. The answer, this is something general, and is not specific to fast done by, fast made obligatory by oaths. وَقَدْ رُوِيَ عَنْ بَعْضَ الْعَيْمَةِ كَأَحْمَدِ وَجَمَاعَةٍ أَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّهُ خَاصٌ بِالنَّذَرِ And it's been narrated from some of the ulama, like Ahmed, and a, and a group of them, that they said it's specific to fasting because of oaths. وَلَكِنَّهُ قَوْلٌ مَرْجُوحٌ لَا دَلِيلَ عَلَيْهِ However, it is a position that is to be refuted, that is rejected, because it has no evidence. And now you know why I'm saying Sheikh bin Baz the Hanbali. Not at all to say Sheikh bin Baz was a Hanbali, a blind follower of the Hanbali method, but in fact as a, a jest or a mockery of those who would say what I, how I introduced the book, that let's just see what the Hanbalis say, or let's see what Sheikh bin Baz said. Of course, he's a Hanbali. We already know what he's going to say. To reject that kind of idea that uh, the scholars, even if they had a madhab that they followed, would not prevent them. And he mentions specifically here, this was the statement of imams like Ahmed and others, However, قَوْلٌ مَرْجُوحٌ لَا دَلِيلَ عَلَيْهِ It is a rejected position that has no evidence. Showing that Sheikh bin Baz was, in all senses of the word, Salafi. Along with following a madhab, Salafi. Anytime that the madhab doesn't coincide with what seems to be the case from the hadith, then the madhab is to be left. And that's the correct way of following the imams. Sheikh bin Baz exemplifying that for us. And add this, and anyone who says that Sheikh bin Baz was a Hanbali and didn't go outside the madhab, then you can add this and many other fatwas to show that that's wrong. قَوْلٌ مَرْجُوحٌ لَا دَلِيلٌ عَلَيْهِ وَالصَّوَابِ أَنَّهُ عَامٌ The correct position is that this hadith is general and unspecified for a specific kind of fast or another. Rather, it's general, including all obligatory fasts. The end of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam قَالْ مَنْ مَاتَ وَعَلَيْهِ السِّيَامِ صَامَ عَنْهُ وَلِيُّهُ That this is... Uh, whoever dies having a fast that is upon him as a duty then let the uh, relative fast on his behalf uh, this is a hadith from the hadith of Aisha uh, and mentions here it's in Sahih Muslim he mentions that it's mutafiq alayh it's mutafiq ala sihatihi and I think he intended that it's, it's in Bukhari and Muslim however it's found in Sahih Muslim and not in Bukhari and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not specify in this hadith vows so then it's not permissible wala yajuz takhsis kalam an-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam illa bid-dalil it's not permissible to specify the general words of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except with evidence لأن حديث النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عام يعم صوم النذر وصوم رمضان and this hadith the words of the rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam are general and they what they include fasts that are obligatory because of vows and oaths and fasts that are obligatory uh, for from Ramadan, and then he goes on with a longer answer. However, uh, I I love to bring that uh, to show uh, the flexibility of our scholars, the 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 fact that our ulama are indeed dedicated to the texts of the book and the sunnah and are not stuck to madhabs, and they follow the guidance of the imams, uh, and they benefit from them without being 
stern and rigid in their following or their blind following of them uh, when they feel that the evidence shows otherwise. Rahimahullah ta'ala wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.